Hi there. You are with Dr. Loren M. Hill, your academic career coach. And I am here today with one of my favorite people on the planet. And I do mean favorite for a number of reasons. <laughs> and today I'm hopeful that she will become one of your favorites as well. So let me welcome today Renee Norris. And she is the CEO and founder of Urban Wealth Management. Welcome, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. And you are amazing. Just don't talk about me, girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so you all can see we, we are good friends. So there will be a lot of friendly exchange and warmth going on in this conversation today. So I just want to applaud you and, you know, as Bonnie Raitt would say, send you your flowers now um, because <laughs> there you go. And you deserve them for, for a number of reasons. I mean, you've helped me tremendously um, with my finances and, you know, beyond that, just personal growth and, and has been in sometimes even been like my therapist, right? <laughs> I would come in for my financial health checkup only to be, you know, getting some tissues from her because of some, you know, shenanigans that I was dealing with in my personal life, or then come in for another appointment and being, being offered coffee or tea because of some stuff that I was going on with the university. So she knows a lot about me. <laughs> And I'm sure that, you know, the people that she works with feel the same way. Like it's, it's more than your money. So you may be wondering, like, why do I have a financial advisor on a wealth management person? And the reason that I thought you all would enjoy a learning about um, Renee and her career trajectory and why I think it's just utmost important that you should have someone like her on your team, if not her, um, because it, it helps you to feel whole. And for those of you who've worked with me, you know that I think that you are a whole person because we all are. It's not just our job. It's not just our spiritual life. It's not just our personal life. We bring all of that to our jobs, to our families, to our communities. And so being mindful about your finances um, is important. So welcome, Renee. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And it's such an important topic. And I would say yes about finances, but your financial life. And really the best means to build it up is to have a knowledge base about making the best decisions, not just about your money, but making the best decisions and having an understanding about what are the best steps for you to go through in order to make sure it's protected for you and your next generation. So it is key. So to your point, is my firm's key element is focusing on women, not at the exclusion of men, but <laughs> predominantly women, because we have been overlooked and underserved so many times and in so many ways. And not only as clients, as customers, but also women who are in the financial industry. They've been kicked out. It's starting to change a little bit, but for many years, there wasn't a support of women because as you know, we are very actively involved and engaged with raising our family. We have to take time off, we you know, when we have in our babies and we're taking care of our parents or our spouse or siblings or whatever. And, um, they were not supportive. So years ago, because I've been in industry for a long time, and I would have to take my daughter to the doctor's office uh, for some reviews 
And the firm that I was with said, well, you have to be back here by a certain time. And I was like, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long it's going to be for me when I go take her to the doctor. I might just, you know, I'm just not going to drop her off and then come back here. So it's, um, it's finally beginning in a, in a very limited, but it is starting to change a little bit. And that's why I wanted to step out of these major firms and really focus on creating my own firm that is focused on women and women's needs. And as a result of that, we have uh, the majority of our client base are women's from across the country. They're Googling it to find out. I want to work with a woman in the mm -hmm. financial. And it's just not important to just focus on managing your assets. It's important to have your financial advice. And so all of our ladies who are financial advisors are also certified financial planners, CFPs. So we give you financial advice. Make sure you have adequate health coverages, insurances. Do you have an estate plan? What's your timeline? Who are you responsible for taking care? We have a checklist of items. And of course, we do talk about for your, um, in, on the investment side to make sure that women have sufficient funds that are set aside for their retirement because we do live longer. And unfortunately, majority of women don't have sufficient funds set aside. So um, our, that's our primary objective. And in addition to the fact that we focus on women, I have an all women team and I want to maintain it. And, you know, I've been uh, recruiting and trying to get more women on board. And uh, you can't promote that you just want to have women that's against the law. Right. So we have a lot of men say, I want to work for that firm. I want to work from them. And so we have to say, sorry, we found somebody else. <laughs> Even though we haven't yet. <laughs> we have to tell them that so that um, they will know we're not, you know, we're not pushing that out there and saying that we just want women, which is unfortunate. And of course, I guess, you know, other firms can't say we just want men, although. They might only have men on their, uh, you know, in their uh, high leads of, um, on their boards or they're uh, leading up different firms and um, organizations, even though they won't put that out there, but that's all they pull in are men. Mm -hmm. and so we're looking to see that changing. It's already started here in 2020 where we are starting to see women step up into some major, major roles. Well, I think it's so interesting. And of course, I had a, a good little, uh, it started to be just a giggle that I was going to st stifle and couldn't. And then I laughed out loud <laughs> because of we, we have to be mindful of our hiring practices. And, and I'm an entrepreneur as well. I have my own business. And it just happens to be that my employees are women and women of color just happens to be that way, right? And so I, what I can appreciate too about you um, in this really male dominated area, you know, the financial uh, sector uh, that you said, I'm out of here. And you took a chance and went out and started your own business, your own firm. And as entrepreneurs, if we do that um, and we are strategic about it, then we can scale, right? And, and provide opportunities for who we want to hire, right? Because you're the boss, so you can hire anybody you want to. And I just love that um, flexibility with my business. And I'm, I'm sure you uh, love it as well. And to be able to exercise the authority to do what you want to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And especially, I would say, you know, you know, as we all know, with the negative and the downside of being in this pandemic has created and people had to work virtually, 
And it's always been an issue for us as women because we're multitaskers. We have right. a lot of things to do. And so now, finally, you know, there is a recognition that for some firms, it's okay for you to work virtually because you're raising your kids, mm-hmm. you, might, you know, or somebody is sick and you got to take care of them, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to work. Right. Or even if you are sick and you're not feeling well, but you still want to work, you know, you can't come into the office, but you can still work virtually. Mm-hmm. It can still get paid. And so there has been an acknowledgement that this stage that we're in right now, um, everybody likes to zoom it, that it's, um, it's really helping a lot of women who are multitaskers, who can still work, who can still be involved with their families. I have a number of clients um, who are much older, and I have a number of them that are much younger who are raising kids. But those who already, whose kids are already grown, they're taking care of their parents. Right. And that is, you know, that's a big, big job and they're still working, but they are the caregiver. And so knowing that you have those other responsibilities, that's why women are so amazing for all of the things that we do. And finally, we're starting to see somewhat of an acknowledgement of that. Finally. And the fact is that women make up the majority of the U.S. population. They say CS is 51%, but I think it's closer to probably 53 to 55%. We won't know until they take that uh, ceremony again, go through that processing until probably 2030. Mm -hmm. But the number is high. And at the end of this decade, the end of the 2020s, women here in the U.S. will own 75% of the wealth in the United States. And it's primarily through inheritance, running businesses, just like you, just like me, a number of other women have said, I don't want to work in these firms because they don't acknowledge me or I know I can go down a different path and really build up my business and create, um, and and not only create a lot more wealth and revenue, but also have the ability to build out what they know is important. And the places that they're working are maybe not all of them, but still, there's still a majority of them are not as supportive. They don't have women that are on boards that are in, um, you know, in these uh, companies where they're at the head of these firms. And by the way, there's only in the U.S. publicly traded companies, there's only 65 companies that are led and owned by women that are publicly traded. And hopefully that number and, and people of color, it's even smaller amount. But hopefully we're going to be getting into that stage where we're going to be expanding that quite a bit. Well, one of the things that you said, and I want to, you know, it took me, uh, took my breath away when you said that women will control what percentage of the wealth in America? Just repeat that for me and for my audience, because that's, that's astounding to me. So could you say that again? I'll say it in two manners. Three quarters, (laughs) 75% of this country's wealth. And that's been um, viewed and um, viewed and looked at and uh, been in historical basis. They've been looking at the fact that women are making up the majority of the the population and also because that's increasing and so obviously with more women stepping up into these roles starting businesses and they're starting to see somewhat of an increase in their income but the majority of it is going to be having a business getting inheritances um you know could be through divorces as well for example um which is one of the really key points that I have shared with a number of women who are survivor spouses. 
when it comes to the social security benefits, as long as they were married, even if they were divorced, mm -hmm. as long as they were married for 10 years, they still can get their surviving spouse who's passed away social security benefit. Mm -hmm. It's a way for them to continue to build up and grow their income, mm -hmm. build up their wealth without, and that's another source of income that they could use to pay off their expenses. Um, and uh, with that and a combination of, you know, unfortunately with a lot of, a lot of parents that are passing away. And since the baby boomers uh, up to this point have been considered the largest, um, right. the largest groups. And that's getting ready to change the Gen Ys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for right now, the baby boomers, and of course, with their parents passing, they're going to be getting these major inheritances. Wow. So these are all things that you are enlightening us about the statistics, the amount of wealth, you know, how many women are in the population and will be in the population, um, as well as positions of leadership and the lack thereof, uh, you know, being occupied by women or uh, those who identify as women. And I, I'm wondering, um, you know, how do you feel about the future with finances and women being able to be in these positions of, uh, you know, th they're managing it, right? They're managing their the company's finances, they're managing their household finances uh, in leaderships, maybe even in a political positions. So there's there's money to be handled and managed. How do you feel about the future of that? I feel very confident about that. And more so in that it's clear that women want to work with women. And as a result of that, if they're working with women who are in a variety of different professions, whether they're physicians, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, sales oriented area, but definitely in the financial industry, insurance, perhaps somebody that's just not focused on commissions and getting money from mm. them, making money. There, women like to help women feel better, get better, and train them so that it's just not about um, giving them money, but helping them to get trained so that they're making the proper decisions. And so I do feel very confident at this point, especially with the fact that women are looking for women and we have women that are Googling online to look for financial advisors, financial planners, and are finding us because we're just a handful of women owned businesses and a smaller handful of black women owned. Mm -hmm. have a diverse team latinos yes african-american and white is also mm -hmm. considered <laughs> diversity and inclusion just all of us we women like to work with women and especially the women that look like them and have the yes. same type of background then it makes it easier breezier for them to have a long-standing relationship with them there have been so many instances where we've had women who have shown up and said, I've been working with, this is not true of all men, but I've been working with this man and all he was interested in was handling my money and the markets have gone down and he hadn't even called me to ask me how I'm doing or what to do or, you know. And even in the conversations with them, ask, how is your family? I always have that conversation. How's your family? How's your health? What are some things that are going on? Has there been a change in your, um, in your occupation, what about your, you know, do you have a health? Do you have adequate health insurance? Do you have an estate plan? Asking those things that don't have anything to do, they don't think it has to do anything with their investments and with their assets, but the only way you can build up your assets in your life is to protect it now, have an understanding of what's the proper steps and make sure that it's set for the next generation or two because of many families 
they didn't have an estate plan, for example, they pass away. Right. They don't have any named beneficiaries and it takes, you know, forever. It takes not forever, but it takes a long time to establish who's and going resources, to right? Yes. So we think about resources in terms of time and money, right? So planning these things on the front end will help you when when the time comes because the time will come right absolutely and it's just not when one passes you could be really sick mm -hmm. who do you have designated as your health care director you need to make those you know make some of those designations at the very least so that there isn't going to be any fights about who's going to be able to assist you even if you're not married, even if you're not have a longstanding relationship with anybody, you might not even have any family members anymore. Don't just leave that out there. Designate some foundations, some organizations that you want to give it to, maybe the high school or the college that you went to. But whatever, be thinking about that so that you have your steps in place already. So anyway. oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. That's all I was going to say. It's important. It is important. And one of the things that I was, you know, reflecting on is that we've, we've talked in sort of broad strokes, right? And I know that when I first uh, met you, I was still a faculty member at a, a university. And so as such, with most employers, they offer you a, you know, some type of retirement, right? And so that could be if you work for the city or the state or the government, there's a particular type of retirement that's offered there. If you work in other industries, there's other things. And at the university that I was at, we had a 403B, right? And so, yeah. First day I'm hired, I meet with HR, I do my onboarding, you know, I did my designated my beneficiaries and I was like, yeah, uh, they did a particular type of matching. So years ago, someone had told me at least if you can get it up to the same amount that the employer offers, then get it up as high as possible and then just sort of set it and forget it. And that was my approach. Didn't revisit it. Um, beyond signing my paperwork, and that was it. And then when I met with you, you were like, when was the last time you looked at your stuff? I was like, what stuff? <laughs> and then you even said, well, you know, your, the whoever your company is, your, the university is using as the company for the retirement, you could meet with them quarterly, you know, biannually, annually, just to check in to see you know, if you want to raise it or how, how your money is even doing. And I was like, mm, okay, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> and so I was just thinking about how many people, whether they're in a university and, and most of, you know, our followers are in some type of academic institution, whether it's full-time, part-time, quarter-time, or even if they might be an in industry, and I'm wondering uh, if you want to give them a few sage words about, okay, maybe I'm not ready for a financial manager or financial assistant outside of what I have at my current place of employment. What can, what can they do to make sure that they um, are, you know, making friends with their, their money? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And actually, the most important is that the money needs to be friends with them. <laughs> so, you know, with the retirement assets, it is important. Typically, these firms do have some financial people there. It's important for you um, in these types of uh, accounts to just pay attention periodically to see what it's doing um, and make sure that a few things. One is, and I'm glad that you pointed this out because you'd be surprised that oftentimes when people set up these accounts and they don't realize that they haven't listed a beneficiary. 
were beneficiaries. They, you know, figure, okay, I'm in there. So that's number one. And I would say, you know, certainly pay attention to who the beneficiaries because you might say, I don't like them anymore, or they passed away. And if you didn't change it, guess what? It stays the same. And that has happened sometimes with some uh, people who's uh, married somebody, and this happened one time, it was horrible, married someone who was divorced, and that man never changed the beneficiary on there, forgot to, and his current wife and his, when he passed, his previous wife got all of his retirement assets, which was huge. So making sure that you have the adequate information on the retirement side. Secondly, is to make sure that you are participating at a higher level. A lot of times people only put in just enough to get a match from their employer. If they say, okay, well, we're gonna match at 5%, people only put in 5%, which is just a few thousand dollars a year. But no, you need to put in more than that because it helps in a number of ways. It helps to reduce your taxes for tax purposes, but it also helps to increase your future life stage, the income that you will need when you do retire. And thankfully, if you are working at some of these major firms and you have these four or three Bs, you'll have a pension, typically, um, and hopefully you will have some additional amount with you putting money into retirement. So making sure also, because sometimes people put money in and they don't select investments in there, it's just sitting in cash and it's not growing. Or they don't realize, hey, I don't understand what these different types of investments are. But you can click on the links and it will give you the background check on all those investments, what the historical uh, returns have been. You know, if it is something that um, has been very volatile, how long it's been like that, if it's just temporarily or, or whatever. So really paying attention to if you don't have, uh, you know, your own financial advisor, you can typically contact the firm and talk to their staff who will give you some insight about where to go to view the history of those. And they might even make a recommendation for you as well. So, you know, take advantage of what your employer's um, programs have and who their staff is that can help you make the best decisions. But try not to do it all on your own, unless you're very confident. And you could be working with a financial advisor who doesn't have, like with us, we don't manage someone's 403B or 401K. But because of the platform that we have, which we call our financial dashboards, the clients can connect those and we can see them. We can't move any money around, you know, can't move money in, can't move money out, but we can view it and make a recommendation to say, that's an appropriate, or maybe you need to consider making some updates or some changes to it based on how you have the funds invested. So really being able to get some advice, I think, is important. And those, uh, you know, connecting with the firm's internal advisors, there's no cost to you for that because it's part of it. So I would strongly recommend you do that. And for those of you who've worked with me before, listen to me, you know, I'm big on schedule it, right? Put, put it in your planner, put it on your calendar to make a call, you know, upon hearing this, if this is the first time someone ever told you to do it, please do that. Um, sooner rather than later, set up an appointment with them to review what you have. The other thing that I uh, remember hearing years ago from Susie Orman um, was make sure you take your money with you, right? And she was referencing like when you leave a company, don't just leave your pennies even there. If it's five cents, one cents, whatever it is, it's yours take it. And I'm specifically talking about your retirement. So when you and I met, you were like, oh, wow, all your money's in one place. And I was like, yes, because I remember Susie Orman said that. And then when I moved again, you know, I let you know, like 30 days before I was leaving so that you could walk me through the process of how to like roll it over or how to shift it so that 
I didn't get in any trouble or didn't know what I was doing, which I didn't. So I was glad I talked to you about it. <laughs> but that having someone manage you through that process um, is very important and just doing it, right? It is. And typically what, you know, let's say you're leaving that employer and you're going to a new one, roll it over to your new employer uh, plan. Um, and, or you can say, okay, well, I don't, you know, I'm not confident about it. I want to roll it over into an IRA. Well, whatever. Um, but don't leave it behind because a few things will happen typically that, um, there will be some updates or some changes to that plan that you won't be able to make any, um, have access to it. They might move to a different uh, provider and, um, all of the investments will change. So you won't have any control. So it's better to move it over to your new employers, roll it over into your IRA. The other thing that I would say here, because the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is going to go away here at the end of 2025, if you've been putting money into a Roth, get it into a Roth IRA. If Even if you're putting it into your new employer's plan, you can separate it, put it into a Roth IRA, because you have to meet the five-year rule in a Roth IRA in order to access those funds out of there. And anything that's in the Roth that you, you know, it's after tax, you can always take that out, no taxes. But whatever the growth is on the Roth IRA, it's got to be in there five years before you can access it and be completely tax-free. And it's completely tax-free if you're 59 and a half. The growth, whatever goes into the Roth IRA that's after tax, you can pull that money out at any time, no matter what. But if you do have a Roth component and you're leaving the firm, pull out that Roth, put the regular traditional 401k, 403b, 457 into another employer's plan and get that Roth and put it into an IRA, a Roth IRA, so you can meet that five-year rule as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. And for those of you who were like, wait, I don't know what she just said. She said something about some money, <laughs> putting it in one account or another. It's okay. It's okay. You can listen to this again, and you can also reach out to Renee and her firm or tech, you know, if you already have an advisor, just talk to them about this. If you're planning to move jobs or move companies, you know, be sure you talk to someone probably within, you know, 30 days of your moving, because there's some uh, time frames around that sort of, sort of stuff. And you want to make sure that you are um, executing these decisions within that time frame. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up to you and I know you you are on the the global stage when it comes to finances. I know you are, you know, on China Money Market Watch and a few other ones which I'm always so proud to be like her. And so one of the things that has come up lately is uh, a the bank has uh, closed in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's it, it's on everybody's lips. And um, I was very surprised to say, because we've had these things happen before, they're not unheard of. And there are ways in which banks are pro protected, uh, you know, by, by the government, frankly, and, you know, not a not a lot of people may know this, but because banks and financial institutions have to pay these fees into a pretty big, you know, pot, when something happens, that's where the protection money comes from. It's not coming from the consumer. And that that's like my real short explanation for it. You can find out more about that later. But, you know, there's been some blame cast uh, at this particular bank because 
apparently they have a, a diverse board and I'm not sure of, you know, what all the positions are, or if that just means they have one diverse person, <laughs> you know, on there. Um, but there's been some spin and some blame. Um, and I think we've heard these kind of things before when it comes to women and, um, you know, diverse demographics, then it's like, oh, that failed because they have a woman leading it or, oh, that failed because they got some people with melanin in their skin on it. And I, I just find that so um, offensive, number one, and just, you know, devoid of any facts or data. And, you know, there have been plenty of financial places that have fallen and been, you know, never resurrected and they weren't run by women or people with melanin in their skin. And so, you know, we have fortunately with us today, um, someone who is in the industry. And I just was wondering, you know, why do you think they're saying that? Well, to your point, though, because in the majority, particularly, let's say, in the financial industry, in the banking industry, in the investment industry, it's male dominated. And the fact that, um, you know, if there is a uh, an issue that occurs, they figure, oh, it's because we have this one DEI on our on our, our, our board that made that decision and, and we have this one woman and, and oftentimes we find out, no, they weren't the ones that did it. They weren't the ones that, you know, requested that it was you all men. <laughs> and they're kind of pushing back on that. Mm -hmm. It's been a very interesting stage right now where women are starting to step up and more and more um, people of color are finally beginning to be, um, uh, allowed to be into some of these um, in these roles because at the end of the day if you are a predominantly let's say using that as a bank that is predominantly just focused on non-diverse communities mm -hmm. then they have a different um, directive and they have different thoughts about how they want to be taken care of and uh, what they want their services to be. And if you've included one person on there who makes a recommendation, let's say this an African-American or it's a Latino to say, you know, these are the kinds of services that we would want to, or women, these are the kind of services and the things that we want to do. And they could be the only one that's on the board, which is typically the case, but it's beginning to change. Um, and then there's a pushback on that. And so they might incorporate that, but they're not making the appropriate uh, updates and uh, stages of that uh, organization to really reach out to that diverse and diverse uh, community. Mm -hmm. And so they might be offering a little bit and the rest of their community says, no, we don't like that. And that organization gets pissed off and then kicks it out and says, oh, it's because that person recommended it but they're not doing the appropriate and taking the appropriate steps to connect mm -hmm. uh, with the folks that we need to. Because um, as you all know, that in the 2040s, that there will be a major, major diversity and inclusion and that whites will be considered minorities. Yes. Yes, yes. And, and so that's another uh, statistic and data point that we should be mindful of. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm the champion of the underdog, if you will, because we've been underdogs for a long time. And I think that it's important for us to be um, informed and stay abreast of what's going on and, you know, informed about our money, informed about our careers and um, just being mindful, right? And being inclusive because I think it's important for there, if, there, if something 
goes wrong, if you will. And I'm not minimizing a bank going under. That's a big thing, right? But rather than blaming or looking for a scapegoat, let's look for some solutions, right? And so what, what happened here and what can we learn from that so that something like this doesn't happen again um, or you can minimize the risk? And I think having diverse uh you know, diversity of thought, diversity of some of the other areas that we typically think about, which are gender, race, ethnicity, but diversity of thought and experience can help us in these areas. And I, again, just thank you so much, um, Renee, for joining me today and having this conversation about finances and you know, how to manage your money or think about aspects of your money and, and think about having, you know, some diverse person um, on your team to help you through their, your money management. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. So, Thank you, my friend, and thank you all for sticking with us today with this sometimes difficult conversation about <laughs> how to be friends with your money, and as Renee said, how to have your money be friends with you, right? So again, I am Loren M. Hill, your academic career coach. Thank you for joining us, and thank you again, Renee.